Your destiny lies with me, Skywalker. You know this to be true. I am your father. <laughs> hey guys. <laughs> Welcome to Can't Tell the Vocal Academy, where the proof is in the singing. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd just be funny. Today we're going to talk about how to be a Yoda Jedi Master Sensei Ninja Warrior Super Singer. And uh, I was just playing with you there for a minute. Uh, it's kind of sort of actually though because we're going to talk quite a bit about it. But anyway, I want to hear who's tuning in today. And <laughs> uh, let's see here. Someone said, I know you heard me sleeping. So where are you guys tuning in from today? It's good to see you. Hey, my apologies uh, for not being here last Thursday. Uh, I was fin finishing up a really important project and and that project is called Voice Repair Heal From Home. So it just released on Friday. So for you guys who have uh, experiencing vocal issues of any kind, uh, it's an extraordinary course to actually help you understand how you can heal your voice from home. Now again, I don't claim to be a medical doctor, so I am not claiming any medical attention. Uh, if you feel that you have a serious medical condition, please consult uh, your healthcare practitioner and uh, get advice from them, but it's just life experience that I've poured into a course to help you heal your voice. Anyway, gang. Uh, I, um, I thought it'd be funny just to kind of go into this. Now, uh, I'm going to go ahead and say hi to some guys here. Let's start here. Sure, it's a nice t-shirt. Yeah, thank you, man. This is my, my lion shirt. Um, now, I want to go a couple things, but before we get there, I want to say greetings from Massachusetts, from Matt. Uh, I'm sure we've got a lot of Florida tuning in. We've got Jennifer Camara back on. Hey, Jen, how you doing? Um, and I got to look this way because I want to keep focused on you once I'm done. I want to push this aside. Uh, awesome. And hey, Ken, far west Texas from Egypt. Egypt and hey, Ken, far from west Texas. So your name is Egypt from far west Texas. Got the human robot tuning in. Good to see you again. Uh, and let's see here. We've got Chastity. Hi, Chastity. Mike Dixon. Uh, the band is just screaming by Santa Cruz. Man, a lot of people from um, from the, the states. Do we have anybody from out of state? You guys, anybody from, I'm assuming we have a lot of other countries going on here. Uh, anyway, but I want to talk about a few things here. Keep posting where you guys, oh, there we go. Germany. Hi, Kay. Um, a big bear. Oh, wow. That's almost out of state, right? <laughs> uh, we've been focusing mostly on the inspiration for singing, the how to stay motivated for singing, how to get started for singing, and all that good time stuff. And that is absolutely necessary. Today is a polar opposite. Today, again, is how to be a Yoda, Jedi Master, Sensei, Ninja Warrior, Super Singer. And guys, I am just going to dive right into it because I've got a lot of stuff I want to cover today. And um, I want to uh, give you guys the goods on this. So I'm going to go through each one of these titles. I'm going to talk about Yoda. You know, who is Yoda, right? And you might laugh, and some of this is funny, but it's actually going to um, come home to roost here in a minute and make some sense. So I'm going to tell you who, according to... Uh, yeah, Wiki, who uh, Yoda was. Yoda was a legendary Jedi Master and stronger than most in his connection with the Force. Now, it's kind of interesting. So, he was connected to something that gave him strength, right? And, and he wasn't just kind of a lone ranger, but he had something that, that motivated him. Small in size, but wise and powerful. He trained Jedi for over 800 years, playing integral roles in the Clone Wars, the instruction of Luke Skywalker, and unlocking the path to immortality. Mortality. Kind of sounds like Ronnie James Dio. <laughs> kind of small in size and <laughs> mighty. <laughs> His little kind of weird immortality stuff. Hey, it could be Pat Benatar too. She was tiny as well. She was quite a powerhouse. Jedi Master. Let's move on to Jedi Master. The Jedi are leaders and peacekeepers in the Star Wars universe. The Jedi Order are depicted as ancient, monastic, academic, uh, meritocratic. Now, by the way, these are big fancy words. Let me break down like what meritocratic is, for example. It's based on talent, effort, achievement rather than wealth or social status or social class and quasi-militarialistic uh, organization whose origin dates back approximately 25,000 years before the events of the first release of the first franchise, the first movie. Okay, so that's interesting. Now, sensei, what is a sensei? Well, I'm going to knock some sensei into you today uh, with some of the stuff I'm going to tell you. Oh, -um -bum. Sorry about that, guys. Sensei is an honorific term to having honor shared in Chinese, Korean, and Japanese. It is translated teacher, master, or person with knowledge who comes before another or is born before another or one who is born before with intimate knowledge. 
to show respect to someone who has achieved a certain level of mastery in an art form or some other skill, i.e. or e.g. accomplished musicians, singers, artists, and in this particular case, martial artists. Interesting that they call them martial artists artists, not just warriors or fighters. They were artists. There was an artistry to it. I think that's fascinating. Ninja warrior. Now these guys weren't such a good guys. These are kind of bad guys, but they, they served a purpose. And let me explain. So a ninja, a Japanese covert agent or mercenary, you guys know what a mercenary is in Japan. The functions of a ninja included surprise attacks, extraordinary physical powers, seemingly supernatural skills, some stealth and deceit, unfortunately, highest levels of Aikido, Judo, and Karate. And of course, we have Super Singer. We know what a Super Singer is. So that gives us all the definitions. But what do all of these things have in common? Okay, I want to kind of talk about this. And I'm going to get down to the nitty gritty today because we've talked again a lot about motivation and some happy clappy stuff to keep us all kind of get, getting going and, and, uh, and, and, and ha being emotionally prepared and mentally prepared for what it really takes to be a ninja, Yoda, Master, Sensei, Warrior, Super Singer. Well, first, what they all have in common is extraordinary discipline. That's number one. And by the way, I'm going to slow these things down. I know sometimes I race over stuff and I talk fast, but I'm going to try to do my best to slow this down so we can really grasp the concepts of this. So number one is they had extraordinary discipline. I got a hair in my mouth and I, I think it's even mine. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm on a roll today. Uh, anyway, uh, extraordinary discipline. That is number one. Number two, they had unique knowledge. Um, and that knowledge uh, is very hard to come by, okay? So they had very unique knowledge. Now, this is gonna relate to us as singers. I'm not gonna just talk about, you know, ninja, super, sensei, warrior, you know, Yodas. So unique knowledge, number two. Number three, the ability to pass on this information to others. Now, that's kind of interesting because when I think of a great singer, uh, I don't know that there's a lot of singers that are great that necessarily have passed on their information except for the fact that their artistry or their story or who they were as people and singers and or their motivation is wanting to sound like them or be like them or learn uh, what, how they got to where they got, um, that would be the motivation or that would be how they were able to pass this on to others. It was by showcasing their skill, showcasing who they were as, as singers in order to be able to pass it on, not necessarily teaching someone. This is related to both, but particularly the ability to teach someone or to pass on information. Number four, the ability to, dis to, di to display these incredible powers. So it's one thing to have a power. It's another thing for Yoda to like, go over like this and move an object, right? Or, or a ninja to do some crazy flip and, you know, take out, take out five guys in one, one hit. Number five, otherworldly abilities that seem almost impossible. So that's kind of interesting too. So I know these kind of are all one and the same, but they have a little bit different twist to them in that, um, they can do things that seem that are unattainable. But we also have a lot of singers that we think, wow, that seems unattainable, right? I don't know, I can't see myself doing that. I think it was Winston Churchill, I think, or no, it was Napoleon, excuse me, that said something like, um, ordinary men can do uh, extraordinary or almost impossible things if death is their only option. In other words, it's a pretty grisly, stark, gruesome comment to make, but what he's saying is if, if he left his men in a situation that they had no way out, and their only way out, they were gonna die if they didn't complete a task, they did extraordinary things. Well, that was true for these ninjas as well. Now, we're not gonna be that extreme with our singing, but I think it makes a really good point. Um, anyway, they were calm and did not get flustered and had total command of their emotion, and physical abilities and could execute those abilities with calm. Interesting, right? So they didn't get uptight, they didn't get frustrated, they didn't get irritated at themselves. I'm sure there was some of that going through the training process, but when the rubber met the road and it came down time to deliver, they had their demure was calm and, and secure and knowing that they were able to complete a task without having to flip out. So their balance was extraordinary. Number seven, they looked beyond the momentary and worked towards the collective good of the future. Now, I don't wanna just rush over these guys because it'd be easy just to do this, but let's think about that for a second. They looked beyond the momentary, what was happening, the gig, the, the gig they're playing right there and then or the practice or whatever it is, right? And worked in their mind towards the collective good, the total good for the future. Now, I didn't say the future of all mankind. I'm not trying to be so altruistic in that. He's like, Ken, I just want to go sing in karaoke. I get it. But the point is, is that 
they weren't so focused on themselves. They were looking for the total good and they had a long-term vision or goal, right? Number eight, they had ancient wisdom. Interesting. It's not looking for the latest greatest. They had ancient wisdom. Pretty interesting. I'm going to get, get into this a little bit more later. They were mysterious. Number nine, you know, that's a mystery. You know, you can't be, hey, go, bro. It's going to do it, right? Because I believe that they were so secure in their knowledge that they didn't have to blab it to the world, tell the whole world, oh, you got to do this, you should do that. Better, better. No, they just quietly delivered and the whole world went, wow, whoa, you know, right? They were extremely hard to beat. Number 10. Number 11, they seemed to have a supernatural force that drove them. So it wasn't just that they could tap into a force, but there was something behind them that was pushing them, okay? So again, this goes beyond just the temporal or the mundane or, you know, uh, material world here. There was something else that, that seemed to be beyond that. Number 12, their personal practice and their training was relentless. Let me say that again. Their personal practice and their training was relentless. Now, this is going to fly in the face again of a lot of the happy clappy stuff we've talked about. Oh, you know, it's your story and it's this and it's all that. Those are motivations and those are great to help us get started. But this is nuts and bolts of what it takes to actually be a sensei, Yoda, master, super singer, ninja, warrior, trainer guy. Okay, number 13. With the exception of the ninjas, they were honorable and even the ninjas were honorable fighting for a cause that they believed in. Now, in other words, they all had a purpose, right? It wasn't just, you know, I just want to go out. Now, for some of you out there, you're going to go, Ken, I just, singing makes me happy. Or Ken, you know, uh, I just want to sing for my girlfriend or my wife or, or, or a song at a funeral or church service or whatever. I just karaoke, busking, I don't care. Or I want to be a superstar, whatever. They all had something that was beyond themselves, a reason for doing it. It wasn't just, um, you know, I'm going to work this hard at something with, for no purpose of no end. Nothing, nothing in the end of this made sense. So, they, so it was that end that they were looking at, the end of the prize at the end of the, you know, the, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, so to speak. They were working towards that to get there, which is what drove them. Number 14, they were highly, they were highly venerated or honored and respected. Okay, So they were honored and respected highly. They didn't care, number 15, they didn't care about what others thought because they knew their skill set had information that went beyond the norm and immediate circumstances. So in other words, when you walk into a room, I think I've shared this story with you before. My son has played a lot of soccer in his day and we got to train uh, in a lot of different countries and we were on this team, Barcelona, which was our favorite soccer team. And it was funny because uh, in the club, the club that we had, the club was so good. The team that was just before us, they had won so many games back to back. They were Ninja Warriors and um, they never lost a game. It's kind of like when I was talking about John Wooden, 10 years of never losing a single game at UCLA as a coach. And so it wasn't when they walked on that field with such confidence, it wasn't if they were going to win, it was by how much. How much are we going to win today? So their confidence was grounded in their skill that left little room for doubt. Now that doesn't mean pride or arrogance. That will also really cost you. It just meant that you walked on that field with that kind of confidence, knowing who you were and what you're capable of. Number 17, their consistency and success rate was extraordinary, if not almost flawless. Interesting. So they were consistent. Their, their consistency was extraordinary. Number 18, I'm almost done with these. Uh, they were not prideful or arrogant. Number 19, they valued guidelines and rules which they lived by. They lived by what they knew and believed, an unwavering truth. Now, this is kind of interesting because everything has laws. Everything has consequences. Everything is subject to something. Singing could simply be age. I mean, I'm 90 and I can't do it anymore. Whatever this thing is, now I show you that you can sing well into your 70s, even 80s. So I'm not, I'm not using that as an example other than to say everything is relegated and regulated by a set of rules that we have to live by. And in this case, theirs were honorable and they looked for a rule system or a value system that drove them. 20, the last one of these, they set the highest standard, standard of the skill sets they achieved. They set the bar as high as they possibly could. Now, in order to set a bar, what does that mean? It means that someone had to go before you to set 
a previous bar and you're gonna look at that bar and try to set it even higher right or at least try to match it so that's why a lot of these other singers that we look towards and say wow that's a pretty high bar that's been set and some people call them come along and they're able to set the bar even higher but the point is that they set the highest standard of skill sets that they achieve now let's break these down one at a time and I, and, and I want to do this again I'm trying to slow this down so we could be honest with ourselves and not pretend that you know we could be some comic comic character uh, and and everyone gets a trophy it doesn't work that way so I had the privilege of living in um, Orange County California almost all my life and uh, there was a thing called the Orange County Fairgrounds and they had these uh, acrobats called the Peking acrobats and these guys were unstinking believable I mean they came from China and their acrobatic skills were off the charts it, it almost looked like they could fly at times I mean they would stack these chairs that were like three stories high two and a half three stories high and jump off them and go into a roll and do some other crazy acrobatic feat and I, I challenge you just look up Peking acrobats and look at these guys they were at the Orange County Fairgrounds we went to go I almost went there exclusively to see these guys and then enjoyed the fair beyond that but they were masters at their craft it was crazy or other masters at their craft tidal wave surfers you ever seen those suckers oh my gosh you know it's like a wall of death of water coming behind you and somehow they're able to pull this stuff off um, extreme mountain bikers seen those guys how about the wingsuit guys that go flying with just the little wings when they're you know traveling at what 200 miles an hour however fast they travel with just wingsuits like crazy stuff sports athletes I mean almost all these guys at the top of their game whether it's soccer basketball football whatever tennis I don't care what it is crazy free divers guys that can go down and hold their breath I don't know if you ever seen that guy that dives a blue the the moy hole or whatever holy cow that is the creepiest thing I think I've ever seen it's like what bad nightmares are made of but these guys do it and they're able to pull it off free climbers seen those guys that climb that one guy that, that does that crazy climb in like record speed anyway and of course super singers and musicians right we're, we're we fit that category if we really practice so every one of these masters has something in common that something in common is being extremely hyper focused extremely disciplined with a routine for discipline incredible precision right by the way you don't just get precision because incredible precision requires information to get you to that precision and that's extremely important that's what I cover in my singing course is not all vocal coaches are created equal not all senseis are created equal not all teachers not all doctors not all lawyers not all whatever not all machines people that build houses whatever that discipline is they're not all created equal you need precision information to get you to the highest level of this otherwise you're just spinning your wheels right ignoring fear right taking chances an anchor that keeps them grounded willingness to go where no one has gone before kind of like Star Trek right um, imagination executed so not just the imagination part of it but actually going after what they hear think and see in their mind they're actually executing that not taking no for an answer not looking back but looking forward I kind of think of that the surfer on the tidal wave and he's not looking back at the tidal wave man he's like I don't want to know what's back there I just got to go this way because if I look back I got a tidal wave behind me that's rushing on me right not faint of heart extremely courageous and a little crazy right or foolish even so I bring this up because these are these are attributes right these are kind of qualifications of what these guys do and if we don't think of it in those terms we're gonna play safe and we're never gonna get anywhere we're gonna ever just get we might as well just stay in our little room and practice if we don't take any chances where are we how are we gonna get 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 to become one of these guys right so let's start with the most obvious question and that is where did these Yoda sensei ninja warrior super singers get their information where they get it and in every case it was ancient wisdom so let me say this another way I don't want I don't want people to think that that there aren't new things to learn of course there are uh, information by the way in informational sciences information more than doubles right now every three months think about that information throughout the world more than doubles every three months look up this informational sciences you'll see this is true that means half of everything we know half of everything we know we found out in the last three months is that wild let me say that again information more than doubles throughout the world every three months 
That means half of everything we know we found out in the last three months. Now, with some exceptions, which is why I'm getting back to ancient wisdom. So, and I don't want to make this sound, you know, really creepy, like, oh, you know, this is like a voodoo stuff from the past. No, I mean, things we know that we've seen throughout centuries being tried and true, okay? Examples of things we know to be tried and true. Now, I'm not saying that can't be trumped by someone else that sets the bar higher and figures out a new way to do something, but those guys aren't the guys looking for a quick fix or some fast thing to get them somewhere. They usually do it because they've had the ancient wisdom first, they've implemented the ancient wisdom and they say, hey, I've done this so long for this way, but what if we tweaked it just a little bit and, and ratcheted it up one notch, we can get it to X, okay? That's an important way to look at this. So this doesn't mean there are new things, of, uh, new things to learn, of course there are, but the real point is that tried and true wisdom of the ages and of the sages actually comes comes home to us here. So I bring this up because everyone seems to be looking for that quick fix or a new hack so they don't have to put in the work and they can take shortcuts. That's sort of, that's the nature of you know the world today, right? No one wants to put in the time and the effort, but if you wanna be a ninja, super warrior, super singer, master, sensei, whatever, you have to put in the time. But these guys were the opposite of that. They were the opposite of shortcut, okay? In addition, the only way they couldn't, could have learned what they've learned was by demonstration. We've seen that a few times. What does that mean? It means that, you know, again, I'm, I keep bringing this point home, but I gotta say this again. I can't believe that people think that they can really learn something quality and credible uh, with any sort of coherency if they're not learning from someone else that can actually demonstrate it. Think about that, guys. Let's use our common sense for a minute, right? If this person can't physically demonstrate it and they can't show other students demonstrating, passing on this information, if they can't do that, they're not giving you the information that's gonna get you where you wanna go. It's just plain and simple. Common sense. So, anyway, by the way, it's by demonstration, not something they read or learned from a textbook, not a sermon they preached from a pulpit, but those that have gone before them, senseis. This is a very powerful concept because they also leveraged balance, speed, calm, groundedness, wisdom, knowledge, and a higher level of thinking to their advantage with a force that drove them a purpose at the end. Okay. Now, interestingly, uh, we have a, a lot of superheroes around us that do that. Now, let's think about this really. We're talking about, okay, how does this like relate to me, Ken? You know, we're talking about like these, you know, Sensei, Master, Yoda, Jedi, you know, what, blah, blah, blah. It seems like so far removed from the culture and the world that I live in. Actually, it doesn't. It doesn't. Think about this. I just mentioned who they were. Tidal wave surfers, sports athletes, free divers, singers, musicians, you know, whatever. These are sensei masters. These are guys that are in equality with the same kinds of guys I'm talking about when I talk about Jedi masters, right? That's who these guys are. We see them all around us. We just don't know how they got there and what it really takes to get there, right? But we're gonna find out in a minute. Check this out. Now, the key is how do we learn from them and apply it to our own skill set and our own disciplines? Reality is that we live in a world with an incredible amount of distraction. Let's slow, I'm gonna slow this down again, okay? Stay with me, stay with me on this. Reality is we live in a world with an incredible amount of distraction, constant vying for our attention, tremendous noise, like how do we hear and see through the noise, and everyone wanting something quick, right? But let's take a look at some of the martial artist's greatest grandmasters. They're called um, Shigung or Shihan quotes. Now these are quotes that span up to a thousand years, okay? These quotes I'm about to talk about are quotes from some of the greatest grandmaster martial artists that have ever lived. And I want to, and, and the interesting thing about this is, so I'm not quoting one guy or one field or one time period. This is spanning approximately about, actually a little over a thousand years, okay? In a couple cases, 2,000 years. Now, this is interesting. So I'm gonna take a look at these guys and I'm gonna start with the very first one. The more you sweat in training, the less you bleed in combat. Ooh, right? The more you sweat in training, the less you bleed in combat. That's a good one. No matter how beautiful the strategy, 
You must look at the results. So no matter how cool it is or all the bells and whistles and flash pods and whatever's going on, don't be fooled, right? Look at the results. Next one. You must not fight too often with one enemy or you will teach him your art of war. That's interesting, right? What does that mean? Well, it goes back to mystery. To me, too, it, it doesn't just mean... Um, fighting against your enemy out there. It could also be fighting against the enemy within. So in other words, not not doing the same thing over and over again. And I'm not saying doing it over and over again and expecting a different result like Einstein said or whoever said that. I'm saying that um, practice what you're not good at. Don't practice what you're good at. And if you let other people see your, and hear the same lick you do over and over and over again, they're going to, oh, that's all they got. Oh, that's their one trick ponies. They can only sing in that one style, right? We want to make sure that you must not fight too much with the enemy or you're going to teach him all that you know and he's going to be able to defeat you. Um, next one. On the day of victory, no fatigue is felt. Ooh, that's a good one, isn't it? On the day of victory, no fatigue is felt. Common sense trumps parlor tricks. That's an interesting one, right? Now, what does that mean? Well, I heard Bruce Dickinson say something about uh, Jamie Vendera. And Jamie's a cool guy and Bruce is a cool guy. This isn't about uh, one pitting one against the other, but it was about Jamie breaking glass with his voice. Now, we know Caruso did that first, or at least we know he did it. I don't know if he did it first. But Jamie Vendera can break glass with his voice. And Bruce Dickinson said almost the same thing. I'm not sure if he was quoting this uh, sensei, but he said... That's a great parlor trick, but can he sing? <laughs> That's pretty funny. So in other words, don't be baffled by the wow of someone getting to hit a high note or singing in whistle register or doing some parlor trick. Be wowed by the total sum of their artistry, their mastery of their art, right? So common sense trumps parlor tricks. Endurance is one of the most difficult disciples, but it is the one who endures that the final victory comes. Let's do this again. Endurance is one of the most difficult disciplines, endurance. But it is to the one who endures that the final victory comes. So if you give up, you don't get the victory. If you endure, you get the victory. And victory is sweet indeed. The greatest fortress starts with the foundation and then built one brick at a time. Guys, do you remember me telling you about how important volume one is in my course and how if you don't build this foundation, you know, my, my daughter and son-in-law are building, are, are doing a, a, an addition to their house. And it was funny because we went there and, you know, they laid this foundation and they sat there with their levels and they were just really anal about love how, how this, this whole, you know, foundation is they're pouring the cement block for the foundation. Man, they are just making absolutely sure that it is just level in every direction. Well, why that's important is the minute you start building on something, if it's not level, you start compensating because the ground was, oh shoot, that's not level. I've got to make an adjustment for this, this beam. I've got to cut a little shorter. Ah, and this one I've got to, uh, oh shoot, now it tweaks this way. And you start building on unsure foundation and the rest of the house is not stable. The stronger or the most stable that foundation is, the better the house. So when the, when the walls went up and the ceiling when it went up, Bam, it went up so fast and the stability of those walls and the ceiling and everything else that goes with it, the additional rooms are rock solid. So in other words, let's do this again. It says, the key is how do we learn from them and apply it to our own skill set and discipline? Because we take this foundation, we start with the foundation and then we build one brick at a time. So we don't worry about, can I do a whistle register? Can I do head voice? Where's my mixed voice? No, 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 no. Those are later additions. We've got to build chest voice first. We've got to build a robust chest voice first. We've got to get a, a, one of those really cut, handsome bodybuilder bodies first. So once we build that body, then we can plug it into any sport that we want or any style of singing that we want to achieve and to accomplish what we're looking to do. Next one. It does not matter how slowly you go as long as you do not stop. Now, isn't it interesting? These are all different walks of life saying this stuff. It's not one era of 50 years or 100 years. It's an era spanning over 1,000 years, right? So they've all come to the same conclusions, all of these guys. So it, the, the one thing that we must conclude from that or drive from that is that A, it's true. B, they can prove it. They've done it. C, they can teach it. 
this is how we learn from it. So we learn from the guys that have done it and this is what they're telling us how to get there. Next, for how can a man die better than facing the fearful odds defending the ashes of his father and the temple of his gods? Now, that might sound a little esoteric and creepy and weird and a little too spiritual, but let's break this down more materialistically if we have to. In other words, how can, how can you die with more honor or better than facing fearful odds, defending your, your, what you believe in, right? And the temple of your gods, meaning something that goes beyond you. So this is saying, how, 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 how is it, you know, you couldn't have a better, uh, you know, when you're singing, let's apply it to singing, your singing couldn't represent you better or going to the depths of being a great singer when you are singing for something that goes beyond yourself, your story, so other people can benefit from your story, uh, singing about something, hope for the future, a challenge, you know, whatever that is, that's the point. Next one, success is not final, failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. Now, often when I hear stuff like this, I think to myself, how many fights did this guy get in that he won and lost, right? I'm never equal. let's put some flesh and blood on this for a second. Let's do this again. Success is not final, so he won some, some battles. Failure is not final, he lost some battles. And, but it's the, uh, the courage to continue that counts, meaning the ultimate goal is to keep on. Now, that's a real, real interesting um, uh, uh, example for us to live by. And, and let me, uh, not to humiliate one of my students, but her name's Katie, and I love her to death. She's so sweet. You guys know her, Katie Shear. And um, I'm gonna give a quick example of this, and she can, hopefully she'll corroborate this. I asked her to sing Black Dog, and she says, I don't even know really much Led Zeppelin. I'm not even sure I really like Led Zeppelin, right? She's younger. And, and my, for anyone to say, I'm not sure if I like Led Zeppelin, it's like, who are you? You're no student of mine, <laughs> right? Just kidding. I'm kidding, Katie. But anyway, so I had to talk her in to doing Black Dog, right? And one of the frustrating things um, can be, or challenging things, is that I've been working with Katie for about three-ish years now. And we have tried a lot of different styles and we've worked on a lot of different things. We're not a one trick pony. And we've tried really hard on a lot of YouTube videos and a lot of different styles. And I kept promising her, Katie, if we stay at it, success will come. Katie, if we stay at it, don't get discouraged. Success will come. Stay working hard. Hold the course. Let's do this. We can totally do this. And when you put up a video and you work really hard at it, and for you out there thinking, wow, you got 6,000 views, that's a lot. That's actually not a lot for Ken Temple Vocal Academy. And we kept only getting views, 5,000, 6,000. We put up a Janis Joplin piece of my heart. We got, you know, originally 10,000 and it stalled. And I'm like, gosh, Katie's killing it. I mean, I stood behind her in my heart and yet we weren't getting the hits, man. We weren't getting the views. Honestly, true story. We worked a little bit and finally, we landed, you know, a couple of songs here and there, started to get a little bit of traction, right? Cool, so it's a little more encouraging. But this went on for two years, guys. Two years, right, of someone working as hard as Katie. Finally, now we've had some good successes. And even without this new success, what I'm about to talk about, even without it, we were well, are well on our way to success. So I know that if you do this consistently, no matter what, ultimately success will come. I know it. I'm, I'm walking on that soccer field right now going, I don't care who I've got to take on. And I don't care how many games I gotta play them, eventually I'm gonna beat those suckers because I know the information I have is real and I know the disciplines I have is real, right? So anyway, so just three days ago, oh, back to Black Dog, sorry. So we get in the studio and we're trying to do Black Dog and she's so frustrated because to be honest, some of the hits of Robert Plant, the way he phrases stuff, is really unorthodox. And so she just wasn't feeling it and she said, I just can't find myself in the song. I can't do this, I'm not gonna do this. I go, Katie, I'm not asking you to do it. I'm telling you to do it. I'm not kidding. I mean, we're in this, this studio, that room right there. And she goes, I can't do it. I can't, I'm gonna, I can't do it. I go, Katie, uh, this isn't an option. We're not quitting. We're gonna do the song. I don't care. I said, I've got a lot invested in you. And you know, we are going to, if we quit, if we quit, we quit on a high. We don't quit on a low. If we're gonna decide to walk away from something. We walk away when we've had success at it. We go, okay, I did this. Now I'm gonna go on and do something else. We're not gonna quit because we can't do something. So she did. She hunkered down. She bit the bullet. She did it. It gets, I think, too 
million, check me out on this, look at my Facebook, two million Facebook or almost two million Facebook views in three days, almost four days. It's just a, a release of this one guy that really, really, by the way, I released it and it did really well. And we did a ACDC video a while back, Shoot to Thrill last year, so it did pretty good. But it got released to the right people that heard it at the right, she got her break. The right person, right place, right time. But she got her break because she was ready. She was a ninja. She was a Jedi. Right? She's moving on to be a sensei at some point. She was ready. She did her, she's doing her homework. Now, is she done? Far from it. Have we completed? Far from it. But we are well on our way. Gabriella Gunchika, the same thing. A lot of our students, same thing. It's the hard work that pays off and we're ready. So, success is not final. Fatal, failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. Now, next one. In the struggle between the stone and water, in time, the water always wins. Isn't that cool? I love that. It's not just the tortoise and the hare. You know, the hare takes a nap and the tortoise eventually wins, it crosses the finish line. In the struggle between the stone and water, over time, the water always wins. Why? It's relentless. Constant dripping, chipping away, chipping away, chipping away, chipping away at that rock. And eventually, I live now in, in, in Flagstaff, Arizona. One hour from my house is the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon was created starting with one drip of water that eventually cut its way to becoming one of the, one of the wonders of the world. In real life, strategy is actually very straightforward. You pick a general direction and you implement like hell. <laughs> I love that, that's great. There's no comfort in the growth zone and no growth in the comfort zone. Ooh. That brands you, doesn't it? Let me say it again. There's no comfort in the growth zone and there's no growth in the comfort zone. When it comes to performance standards, it's not what you preach, it's what you tolerate of yourself, which in the end is what you'll produce. Let's say that one again. When it comes to performance standards, a standard of performance, it's not what you preach. Hey, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. It's what you tolerate of yourself. Well, yeah, I couldn't get up today. Yeah, I can only do this much. Yeah, you know, it's a little high to try to shoot that thing today. What you put up with yourself or what you compromise of yourself, which in the end is what you'll end up producing. That will be the byproduct is what you put in is what you're going to get out. Japanese proverb, fall down seven times, get up eight. Love that, right? We all heard that one before. Next one, this is a great one. If size mattered, then the elephant would be king of the jungle. Pretty cool, huh? If only singing high notes was what it's all about, then only the guy that sang high notes would rule the world with their voice. But that's not the case. So if size mattered, the elephant would be the king of the jungle. I fear, oh, I love, this is a Bruce Lee quote. And I'm gonna show you some things on Bruce Lee. He has got some awesome quotes. I fear not the man who has practiced 10,000 kicks once. Say this again, I fear not the man who has practiced 10,000 kicks once. I fear the man who has practiced one kick 10,000 times. Ooh, do you get that? In other words, he has become an absolute master and impenetrable at this one thing. I don't care about how many times he's divided up his talents over all these different things. You know, a jackal of many trades, master of none on the 10,000 kicks over here. I care about the, how he's perfected this one thing because that's impenetrable. I'm going to have a tough time breaking through that. Great quote. Now, next one. Take things as they are. Punch when you have to. Kick when you have to. <laughs> I love that. Punch when you have to punch. Kick when you have to kick. Bruce Lee. In other words, as we're singing a song, we don't have to kill it all the time. Sometimes we use our chest voice. We kick when we have to kick. Sometimes we use our head voice. We punch when we have to punch. Let it be what it needs to be when the appropriate time comes. Don't try to cut the piece of the puzzle out to fit what you want to fit in the puzzle. Understand how to kick well, how to punch well, and how to use those skills at the appropriate time. I cover that in my singing course. Next one. What, by the way, I'm almost done with these, but I'm gonna make some real cool points here at the end. Now, by the way, do you see where I'm going with all this, guys? I mean, these guys are coming, again, from different walks of life, 
different disciplines, different times. The world is always going to be crazy. There's always going to be something vying for your attention. I'm sure back then they, they suffered to some degree of the, the quickest, latest, greatest, fastest, whatever. But they're telling you here how to become these warriors, how to get great at something. Now, what gets us into trouble is not what we don't know. It's what we know for sure that we are too lazy to do. Ooh, brutal. Force has no place where there is need of skill. Love that. I teach that in spades in my course. In other words, it's about the nuance of everything and the skill of knowing how to balance all of these things together with a skill set and a mastery of that skill set. It's not forcing through something, not forcing my voice up to the top. It's about how I know to get to certain places in, in the pockets of singing in order to be able to implement this. So let's say it again, force has no place where there is need of skill. Great one. Greatness is endurance for one moment more. Did you hear that? Greatness is endurance for one moment more. Next one, most people never run far enough on their first wind to find out they've got a second. Ooh, that's a good one. This game is 99% mental. The other half is physical. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Let's do that again. This game is 99% mental. The other half is physical. In other words, just when you thought you had it all together, then there's this other half. There was a funny quote. What was it? Um, uh, someone had said, you know, marriage is a 50-50 proposition, right? <laughs> Wait, no, let me get this wrong. I said that wrong. Wait, marriage uh, is, it, was it marriage is a 50-50 proposition? Um, oh, darn, I, I messed it up. I'll have to come back in full circle and remember that. Scrape, scrape that one. Censor that one. That's marriage. Let's see. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I'm sorry. I got it. The Those that think that marriage is a 50-50 proposition doesn't know the half of it. That's what it was. I mean, the, okay, marriage that thinks that, people that think that marriage is a 50-50 proposition doesn't know the half of it. I redeemed myself. Next one. The master has failed more times than the beginner has ever tried. Another Bruce Lee quote. By the way, speaking of Bruce Lee, I gotta show you something. Check this out. He wrote down a chart. And I don't know if you're gonna be able to see this chart. I'll try to kind of get it like this, right? I'll just show you the chart. And apparently he had a, a karate school at one point. And apparently this was up on his wall. Now, some of this was written in, in different languages, but when it was broken down, so it was a chart. And on top of this chart, I don't know if you can see this, there's a chart here. And he breaks down, you know, different levels of how you get to certain places in your mastery, right? And the first one says, are you the student, right? It's kind of bonehead, simple uh, question. The left says yes, and the right says no. And then on the left, it says, are you the student? Yes. Go practice. <laughs> On the right, it says no. It says, find the most difficult technique. Go practice. <laughs> That's awesome. The next one, is there someone better than I? On the left, it says yes. And then it says, keep practicing. <laughs> On the right, it says no. Find someone better than you. Go practice. <laughs> That's awesome. Next one, you just finished practicing. Go to bed. Wake up. Keep practicing. <laughs> Last one says, uh, you are practicing right now. Good, don't stop. This is, uh, was on his wall at his karate club. I just think that is, that is, that is so Bruce Lee, right? <laughs> Ninja. So anyway, next one here is, the tragedy of life lies not in the reaching of your goals, but in having no goals to reach. Ooh, isn't that kind of painful? Think about that. I mean, we go through our whole lives if we don't actually go out and try to do something and we don't have a goal to reach, man, just get started. It's the coolest thing ever. Next one. I've had so many, or excuse me, I've had as many doubts as anyone else. Standing on the starting line, we are all cowards. Taking the first steps is a leap towards victory. Wow, that was a cool one. That could have been a good one for us about getting started, right? I never read that one before. It's really cool. Last couple. Not less than two hours a day should de be devoted to your craft. Bruce Lee, again, I think I heard he practiced six, seven hours a day, sometimes eight. Not less than two hours a day should be devoted to your craft. Guys, I cover this in my singing course. I say, give me at least an hour, six days a week. This guy's asking for two at least, right? At least, not less than two hours a day. Now, 
The heights of great warriors reached and kept were not attained in sudden flight, but while their adversaries slept, they were toiling upwards in the night. Now I know this is poetic, but let's, let's do it again. The heights of great, great warriors reached and kept were not attained in sudden flight, but while their adversaries slept, they were toiling upwards in the night. In other words, they out-trained their opponent, didn't sleep, and relentlessly trained, trained, trained until they conquered. Last couple, closing in here. Men, uh, by the way, this was a, a really interesting, uh, I think, un unfortunately, this was Mao Zedong that wrote this regarding his warriors, but nonetheless, um, it said, men wanted for hazardous journey. This is an actual uh, publication of, of, a, of an enlistment for, for mercenaries, for warriors. Men wanted for hazardous journey, relentless training, low wages, bitter cold, long hours of complete darkness, safe return doubtful, destination unequaled victory. In other words, the wow of accomplishment. Now, why that's funny is, let's translate this another way. Men, uh, men and women wanted for singers, right? Relentless training, low wages, bitter cold, small audiences, <laughs> long hours, training complete in darkness or, you know, living in darkness, safe return or turning back around is doubtful, but the destination glorious, right? We could retranslate that with all kinds of stuff. This is my last couple quotes here, guys. How, how many things apparently impossible have been performed by resolute men who had no alternative but death? I actually started out with that one. It was Napoleon said that. I'm almost certain of that. Now, I'm going to close with two that are not Ninja Warrior, Gyoda, you know, Jedi Masters. These last two are awesome. I wanted to include in this list because in their own right, they are warriors uh, for, for, of their own right. This one, overnight success feels great after playing 10 years in honky-tonk bars behind chicken wire. Willie Nelson. Last one. And I'm going to close this part of this with this. Only a fool does something new and thinks it will work for sure. Only a failure refuses to try something that might not work. Now, that's Seth Godin, but that is really cool. Here's why. You're going to go, well, I kind of went over my head. What does he mean by that? What he means is, is that as we're trying something new and we really believe it's going to work, the world is going to look at us like idiots. They're going to think we're fools. But we stepped out. We did something with our lives. We accomplished. We didn't look back on something. Today is the day to be what you might have been, right? Start today. I could have been this. No, you could be that right now. You do this right now, right? So who cares if the world calls you a fool? Because what he said, only a failure, a person who fails, refuses to try to something that might not work. Oh, I'm scared. I don't think I can do that. I don't know but we can. Guys, I'm going to open this up for questions. Uh, I know that was like a 45 minute monologue from me to you, but I thought this was really cool because if we're truly, truly, truly alert, wanting to know how to be a Yoda, Jedi, Sensei, Ninja Warrior, Master, Super Singer, the proof is in the doing and the discipline. And we've talked a lot about our feelings and our stories and all these different things and encouragement and inspiration. And that is true and that's necessary. That is one of the components of what we just talked about, about doing something beyond yourself, a reason for doing it. Because if you don't have a reason, what's the point? You know, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't give you much motivation. We have the reason and now we understand the discipline and I cover all of that in my singing course, how to sing better than anyone else. So opening up for questions, what if I find a vocal coach that has a good singing voice, but he has bad technique? Should a vocal coach prove that their method works in application? Well, that's an easy one because they'd be able to demonstrate that with other students, right? So um, they would be able to walk through with other students, not just because they sing themselves. So it's a good point, but the point is what they said here, that a true sensei doesn't just do it themselves, but they can replicate it. That's what we do here at Ken Temple Vocal Academy. Now, uh, next one, Mark says, I hear lots of people say things like, stay in your lane in terms of singing. How can you differentiate from growing the voice and achieve greater limits and understand your vocal fox? Well, I think I'm a living example of that and I think my students are living examples of that. And if any of them are, are online right now, I wish they would kind of dive in and log in and, and, and field some questions here. Think about this. Now, 
there are one trick ponies and most most singers gravitate towards being a one trick pony and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. They, you know, if you listen to, you know, do I expect uh, you know Rob Halford to do something other than Rob Halford? No, he's Rob Halford and he became great doing that. That's fine. But what I'm saying is if you're really learning for the technique for the toolbox to expand your horizons, all of my singers do that. All of them. Now you could say, oh, well, are they really good at a lot of things but not great at lot? No, no, they're great. We do the 10,000 kicks on one thing. <laughs> and then once we got those 10,000 kicks, then we do the 10,000 kicks on another thing. So we keep going after those 10,000 kicks. We don't just stop at one. So I cover that in my singing, vo uh, uh, my singing voice. He says like, learn, learn piano rather than learn voice. Now think about this guys, if you're on guitar, and, and it is true, I mean, some people are just have an affinity and a natural ability towards one style, let's say. But I remember when I first started playing guitar, my first instrument, I was a rock guy. I just liked rock guitar, you know? So I wanted to be Jimmy Page or, you know, Joe Perry or whomever, right? I wanted to be, you know, Led Zeppelin, Aerosmith, you know, John McLaughlin, Albert Miola, you know, uh, a lot of the greats that were, you know, Carlos Santana, etc. And then later, you know, I wanted to be like Steve, uh, I liked Luke Luther, Steve Luke Luther early on, in, late in the 70s. And then I liked, you know, Paul Gilbert, you know, some of the technical guys. I love Malmsteen, you know, and Dan. And, and so, but with that said, all of a sudden, I got kind of bored of doing the same thing over and over again. I go, gosh, there's certainly more to this. So I started to learn flamenco. Now, some of like the Malmsteen stuff and, you know, learning, you know, some Deep Purple and stuff, Richie Blackmore, some of that does have some Paganini in it. Some of it is, is has some classical music in it. But I learned a lot of flamenco and I got really good at it. In fact, you can go listen to some of my Nuva flamenco stuff. And I was on, I was in fuego and a lot of stuff. It took a lot of time, a lot of pra practice. It changed, I had to change a lot of habits. And then, you know, blues was very different. And then I learned a lot of jazz because I got tired of that. So I learned some jazz stuff. So within all that, I just took on a different style and I went after it. The same is true for singing. We can take on different styles and get great after at it. We don't have to be myopic and just very be in your one your in your one lane and stay in your one lane. I just don't believe that. Just like in vocal fox, I don't believe that everyone's sentenced to the same vocal fox. So anyway, all right. Uh, it's the same as learning a one language and another. You're right. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, Gio Gimiente. What can you tell about Mariah Carey? Is it possible that her voice recovers because she's singing much better every time? Yeah, it is possible. I don't know. I didn't get to see an uh, endoscope. I didn't get to see the stroboscopy of her, her chords. But if she gets with the right people, she should be able to recover. Uh, what really hurt her a lot was um, not warming up. She stopped warming up a lot between some of the shows and whatnot. And then her flagellate whistle register uh, also cost her a lot. So that's dangerous. It's a lot like singing with distortion. Uh, she did it with a lot of regularity and you have to come back and actually get good chord closure uh, or you get dysphonia which is the loss of sound in your chords so Gaston hey my buddy Gaston how you doing absolutely if you don't quit and keep working the voice you will get better and better and better until you become a great singer the training is on the throat muscles and diaphragm to some point but the real training is in the mind because your mind has to know what the mus how to tell all the muscles to move and KTVA does that check out Gaston stuff we've got a lot of stuff with him and Gaston is awesome he's one of the K my KTVA vocalists and I couldn't agree with you more Gaston Let's see. Andrew Benson, should a boy soprano use the diva or dude exercises? Good question. Um, I actually do both, um, Andrew. When I I'm singing in a tenor range, my tenor stuff goes up into the alto register and also tips into the soprano register. So I'd recommend first building the chest res register as a tenor. And then if you want to build your head voice on top of that and go into um, the soprano register, there's no problem with that. I do it all the time. But my recommendation would be if you're doing my course, not just random exercises. If you're doing my course, you do two days of chest workout and one day of head voice workout because head voice actually atrophies your chest voice as you're going through the growth process of this until that gets fused together from chest, mixed voice, and head where you can actually then do your uh, workouts as one long workout combining both chest, mix, and head voice into the soprano registers. Hopefully that answered that. Um, Andrew Benz, or excuse me, uh, Mel J. Interesting, Ken. I practice daily, then I feel the need to have several days of vocal rest. Each time I come back to practice, my voice is so better than the last. So those three day breaks 
Jacob sing to help R and R. Yeah, you know, you shouldn't really need that. Some people do. Maybe you're practicing a little too hard and pushing yourself too much. You know, you really should be able to practice six days a week and take one day off. That's been, you know, my protocol for 35, 40 years. Um, but if that works better for you, that's great. Chances are, though, it sounds to me like you might have something else going on. You might be practicing too hard. You might have post nasal drip or maybe some acid reflux or not sleeping well or, you know, drinking too much alcohol or, some, or, or caffeine or something that's dehydrating the body. So there's something else in that that you should probably visit um, doing that. But that helps. Cool. Nikki, when I started, I hated my voice, but after working on it for a year now, I think it's unique. My goal now is what do I bring to the table? Embracing what I can, working on new things to develop? Well, let's look at it this way, um, Nikki. We got to get good at that one kick first, just like Bruce Lee said. So get yourself really good at that one kick. And if that's your own identity and being good at your one thing, hey, there is nothing wrong with that. I can't imagine Stevie Nicks sounding like, you know, I don't know, Steve Perry, <laughs> right? That ain't going to happen, I don't think, for her. But she could have branched out and done some other things. Um, but in the answer to that question, be good at what you're good at first. But then again, what Bruce Lee said, practice what you're not good at. Don't practice only what you're good at. Okay, that's how we get better. Dalton, should a singer sing throughout the day even on a performance day? No. Well, actually, yes and no. The first thing is, Dalton, is um, it's like working out at a gym. If you, let's say you want to do your workout, you don't do it in the morning if you have to sing at night because you've spent the voice. The voice is spent, okay? You do it about an hour before your performance. Try not to wait more than 20 or 30 minutes between your, your workout and your performance time. Now, we don't always get the luxury of that depending if we're traveling to the gig or there's not a place in the room where we can practice. We have to, have to go out to the car or whatever it is to practice. Um, but definitely get your warm-up time as close as you can. Now, remember, guys, I've told you this before. The voice has a biological clock and likes to be worked out at the same time. So if you're a morning person or you've trained your voice to be a morning person, you work out in the morning, you do your morning uh, workouts every day. If you know you're going to be singing at night, do your workouts as, as often as you can. Try to train the voice for its biological clock to be worked out at night so it's used to singing at night. Now, on gig days, my recommendation is do a lot of drip drills, drip, drip drills, lip drills. Say that three times fast. Lip drills, lip drills, lip drills. Um, and, and, and just do those gently throughout the day. Now, if you have a job where you talk a lot or you have the, on the phone and you talk a lot, don't. Don't do that. Wait till nighttime. But if you don't, and you can lip, literally just you know, do this 10 minutes, 15 minutes, stop for a little bit, come back, five minutes, you know. Throughout the day, gently keep the voice pitched nice and high, what I call little boy voice. Then that can help you if you do it really gently throughout the day and then do your warm up and then do your performance. Hopefully that was helpful. Steven, is there a point where some men do the diva exercises once they grow the range? Yeah, I do it every day. Absolutely, Steven. Absolutely. Uh, I do it kind of in shifts though. I, um, I'll either do, depending on what I'm singing, if I'm singing like Steelheart, I do my diva exercises. If I'm doing Coverdale or Lou Graham or Paul Rogers, something in lower register, I just do the dude's uh, tenor workout, you know, the dude's workout. Um, if I am only looking to grow and stretch my voice and, and, and lengthen it, and I'm not singing or gigging, I will combine both the male and the female workouts and I'll do a two hour workout or at least 75 minutes where I combine both dudes and divas. Volume three, hardest workouts on both of them. I'll do them back to back. Sometimes I'll take a 15 minute break in between, but I do do them back to back. So so now, Riley, I started two years ago with KTV and I am way more confident now. Awesome, Riley. Not just confident, but I have built the actual muscles to be consistent. That's how it's done. We see the proofs in the singing, proofs in the martial arts right here. That's awesome, Riley, and it is true. So I built the actual muscles to be consistent. Steven, do you believe the KTV method would work for um, musical theater? Absolutely. In fact, I don't want to, I'm not allowed really to talk about how I teach them very high level people in musical theater. Um, very, very high level. And um, the difference in what I teach is more on the operatic side. Now, let's remember that theater got its technique from opera, okay? Because early on, that was the theater, was opera, right? And then we got more into Broadway stuff. Now, in the 70s, late 60s and early 70s, the Broadway era got really hung up on making sure that the person in the last row could understand what you're saying because of the storyline. So, you know, if it, Diamond Zara girls best friend, ah, right? They just have this really over accentuation of, you know, the, the, the vocal tract and, and, and uh, the enunciation of the words and so on. In bel canto, which just means bel, is bel canto, beautiful singing, cantor, you know, beautiful cantor, um, they didn't care. They, they assumed that when you walked into the theater, you already knew the storyline 
and you were moved by the beautiful music and, and, and the beautiful melodies and the beautiful singing. So they assumed you already knew the storyline, and so they were more worried about the actual technical side of being able to sing these notes, these giant notes, and, and, and move you with the emotion of their voices, not worrying so much about the person in the last row. So that was a remodification of classical training modernized to Broadway. So you, what you do is you take bel canto, and then you can go in and add and over enunciate the vocal track as is necessary for whatever role that you're looking to play, okay? Next one, here we go. Uh, mental arts is your name. Uh, can one stretch their range in, low, in a lower direction as at the same time as a higher direction? You know, you can, but I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, that's a really great question, uh, mental arts. The reason is, is that um, when you're setting the voice high, you're looking to set it high, you really want to keep that, do that 10,000 kicks on that, like a lot of times, till you master that, then you can set that over there for a second, and then you can start kicking low and, and, and grow that part of your voice. Now, what that's gonna do is it's going to lock you down from getting back to kicking over here on the high notes. And then you're gonna to have to referee back and forth between a lowered, a hyper lowered laryngeal position, a neutral position, and so forth in the larynx. So you really wanna compartmentalize those and do this separately, and then when you're all said and done, once you've done it, you're going to learn, oh, now I've already built the body strength for a lower, really lower register and an upper register. So at any given time, the way I warm up, then I know like riding a bicycle or learning a language, I know I can speak in French one day and then the next day I can go back and speak in German or Japanese. Okay. Good question. Uh, BJ, I'm getting good questions. Guys, I really appreciate getting, um, uh, really educated questions coming my way rather than kind of dopey questions because it helps me help you uh, on your singing journey. So thank you for thank you for that. And it, it's an encouragement to me to want to continue to do this. Uh, BJ uh, Salafai, Ken, I've been self-training uh, with Mastering Mix by Brett Manning and I find it very effective. My question is, what is the difference between your program and his? Well, um, I think the proof is in the singing. Brett doesn't sing that well, <laughs> no offense, uh, but he has a lot of students that do. He has a couple teachers that sing okay. Um, I think I think myself, I want to be clear about this, very, very clear about this. I'm not interested in bashing other vocal coaches. Brett Manning's course is not Brett Manning's course. Ooh, did I say that? Let me say it again. Brett Manning's course, Mastering Mix, is not Brett Manning's course. Brett Manning took Seth Riggs' method of speech level singing with a little adjustment here and there, put his own name on it, and it became you know, singing success and then mastering mix. So if you want, let's go straight to the originator of that, which is Seth Riggs. Now Seth has taught a lot of really high, powerful guys. Um, Seth was a speech pathologist and Seth comes at this from a very different approach than let's say an operatic uh, teacher would teach. So within the support mechanisms, really, really developing diaphragmatic support, early bridging, uh, master mix slash, you know, singing success slash, you know, speech level singing supports early bridging and a lot of things that are un, uh, unsustainable in the world of belting, in the world of distortion, in the world of, of, of connecting chest and head in the same kinds of ways. So it's a very, very, very different course. So if you want to learn Brett's course and it's working for you, learn it. Kick that ball 10,000 times over there and decide if Ken Temple of Vocal Academy is right for you. Come over here and kick this ball 10,000 times. Next question. Um, T. Inglis Bean Sinabar. So I'm sorry if I'm <laughs> butchering your name there. Um, I'm, I'm a perfectionist. I always think that I can do better uh, what I have done previously. If it's not good, Pavarotti. Yeah, I mean, I am too, right? So we all, that's where we want to go. So that's awesome. I, I'm not sure if that was a question. Um, uh, let's see, Morellis Mirage, do you have any tips for people with asthma regarding singing? I do. Um, it's not something that I can give right here and now, but, uh, uh, and again, seek medical advice. I'm not a licensed healthcare practitioner. Please see a licensed healthcare practitioner. There, my son, True is his name, as I mentioned even earlier today, was a big soccer player. And I'm going to say this as personal experience. I'm not going to tell you this is medical advice. I'm just going to give you personal experience, okay? I've trained thousands of singers over the years, and I'm going to get back to my son in a second. I've seen people diagnosed with a lot of things where they are sentenced to prescription drugs for the rest of their life. In your case, inhalers. Now, inhalers can destroy your vocal folds, as you know, and can really, really wreak havoc on singing. They can be life, uh, you know, saving and life threatening if you don't have them. Let me say this again. They can be life saving if you have them and life threatening if you don't have them, depending on your condition. 
But not all asthmatics are all the same. Not all medical conditions are all the same. My son early on when he was around 14 years old was uh, again diagnosed by a very, very high-end doctor. I'm a man of means, so I was able to kind of take him wherever we needed to go for medical attention. And he saw a doctor that told him he had asthma. My son, he will corroborate this, corroborate this. And I looked at the doctor and I go, my son is like one in the, one in number one in the nation on what's called the beep test, which is an endurance test for running. And up two years, his senior, by the way, so as a 14 year old, he was taking on 16 year olds and whipping their bum in what's called the beep test. I don't want to go in what this is, look it up. And so the doctor says, well, it's going to, you know, over time, he's going to lose that. Don't discourage him, but he's probably going to need to quit playing soccer. This is age 14. I didn't believe that. And I've learned a lot about that. What happens in the medical profession and in industry of them prescribing drugs to people for the rest of their life and sentencing them to certain things for the rest of their life. So I turned to the doctor and I said, how can you be certain of that? And he says, eight years at Harvard, blah, 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 and, you know, my residency at blah, blah, UCLA Medical Center, blah, 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 blah. you know, and if you don't do what I do or what I prescribe, I don't want to see him as a patient. Go find someone else. I'm like, whoa, he just sentenced my son to a lifetime a very, very uh, heavy dosed inhalers, right? And by the way, when you take a steroid, steroids fundamentally change muscle structures, it rips at the cords, all kinds of stuff, and it's something that doesn't necessarily get better, but probably gets worse over time. And so I said, is there any other alternative? And he said, absolutely not. You know what? I said, thank you for seeing us. You're right. I don't think you're our doctor. I tried some holistic things, not the least of which were, you know, uh, a, a good uh, humidifier in his room, uh, some uh, breathing exercise things that I've done with my students over time, the other people that have had asthma and whatnot. He recovered 100% within a few months, has never had another episode, and he's a 24-year-old guy living in Los Angeles, kicking major butt with like the healthiest kid I know, and it's never, it's never turned back. We've never looked back from that. So, um, and I'm going to close out with this question, guys, because I'll take more next time, but we really need to get to the bottom of what did we just learn? We needed precision information. We need people that have gone before us to prove it out themselves. We need to know that the information that we're getting is legit. Yes, there's a lot of noise out there. Yes, there's a lot of things vying for your attention. But here I'm doing my best to give you the, my, the honest, the most honest, legit life experience information I can as a sensei in order to be take, take this information and pass this on to you, my students. Hopefully, gang, this was helpful. God bless you guys. Until next time. Now, I'm not going to be here next Thursday. I'm going to drop my Thursdays for a while because I have some heavy traveling coming up. So I'm only going to be able to do a couple more Saturdays, and then I'm going to take a little break for a bit. So make sure you stay tuned for those if you have questions and stuff you want to get answered. Um, and I will be resuming after that, but I've got some heavy-duty traveling coming up. So I'll do the next two Saturdays, and then that's going to be it for a bit. So stay tuned for those. God bless you, gang. And until next time. Peace out.